And now, here's your host, Christian apologist, Bob Siegel. And this is Bob Siegel. So, you'd like to believe in God, but you can't believe in a God who hates homosexuals. Well, neither can I, my friend. Neither can I. I can't believe in a God who hates anybody. But you need to go to God's Word itself, not other sources who filter it for you. There's a reputation Christians have in the media today, in some of our public schools today, and it's just not true. The Bible does not teach that God hates homosexuals. The Bible does not command Christians to hate homosexuals. Now, the Bible does challenge a gay lifestyle, But it challenges all kinds of lifestyles, claiming that we're all sinners. It challenges my sin. Now, I understand that human beings are going to disagree as to whether they believe in the Bible, disagree as to what is or is not a sin. But I have a question for you. Have we reached a point in our culture where mere disagreement must be equated with hate? I have all kinds of friends who disagree with my lifestyle. My beliefs, my Christianity, they are not Christians. They do not believe in the Bible. They think it's nonsense, even though I embrace it. But I do not accuse them of hatred simply because they disagree with me. And they would be quite insulted if I did accuse them of that. And they would have a right to be insulted. Well, it works the other way, too. Joining me today to explain in a friendly and loving way Why the God of the Bible Disapproves of a Homosexual Lifestyle is one of my rotating co-hosts, Kevin Conover. Kevin, welcome back to our program. Hey, Bob. Thanks a lot for having me. And and, uh, this is such a big issue. You know, on Tuesday, they're going to be taking up Prop 8, uh, which defines man and a woman. It was a constitutional amendment that was uh, put forth in the applied to the California Constitution, saying that marriage is defined as a man and a woman. And it's going to the Supreme Court on Tuesday, and they're going to be start discussing this and debating whether or not this should be uh, allowed. And this is a very interesting subject because originally there was a different proposition where the people of California affirmed marriage between a man and a woman. It was overturned by the California Supreme Court saying it was unconstitutional, meaning the California Constitution. So they said, okay, we'll make it a part of the California Constitution. Exactly. So then they came back and ruled the California Constitution unconstitutional by comparing it to the federal Constitution. That's right. They had an overwhelming majority vote that the uh, amendment to the Constitution in California to pass that, but uh, it was overturned again, and so now it has to go to the Supreme Court where they will finally make the decision uh, whether this is uh, legitimate or not constitutionally. And what do you think? Do you think... the what do you think the Supreme Court's going to do? Boy, I, I sure hope it it uh, approves it. I'm a little nervous. I used to be more confident um, since John Roberts' decision over the HHS mandate. I'm a little more skeptical. Um, but, you know, there is uh, – typically it breaks down four to four. With, with one swing voter, exactly, Kennedy. Exactly, with Kennedy as yeah, a swing vote. Yeah. And right now what he's stated is he's uncomfortable with how much um, – how many decisions they're making regarding – uh, what's happening in society and the culture. They might just say they want to throw it back to the states. It's possible, yeah. I, I'm a little nervous, too. Now, what, the only thing that gives me a little bit of hope is when Prop 8 was being voted on, everybody was saying there's no way that's going to pass, and yet there was fasting and prayer in California. So uh, left up to human devices, I think the Supreme Court will overturn Prop 8, but we could have a miracle. It's yeah, not, yeah. It's not unprecedented. I think that's what it's going to take. I also think this is more of a free speech issue than an issue about marriage. But I know that you want to get into a lot of the harm that's caused by Yeah, you know, uh, something that pops up a lot is that people don't understand why the Bible is opposed to homosexuality. And I'm an apologetics teacher. I teach the defense of Christianity. I give the reasons for uh, a lot of what the Bible says. Instead of merely quoting scripture. Exactly. And so what I want to do is look into the background, kind of go, okay, why is God in the Bible opposed to homosexuality? What are the ramifications for society? What are the practical implications of the homosexual lifestyle? And is there justification for the Bible's position against uh, specifically the homosexual uh, lifestyle? Well, you know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, as you would have people treat you, treat them, for this fulfills the law and the prophets. Law and the prophets was what they called the Old Testament. He's saying, if you want to know why God called somebody something a sin, figure out how it is harmful. Exactly. Figure out how doing it would be selfish and how it would hurt someone. And so, of course, people are going to go, well, two gay people getting married, that doesn't hurt anybody. But I think they would agree that if it could be shown that it does hurt somebody, 
that would be a different story. Well, this is going to be <clears throat> fascinating, Kevin, but first... Welcome back to our program. You're listening to Decay CBQ Intelligent Talk 1170. This is Bob Siegel and Kevin Conover. Hey, thanks a lot, Bob. You know, in in the book of Mark in the New Testament, uh, there's a story about Jesus in Mark chapter 2. He's walking along, and his disciples start to pick heads of grain. And uh, the Pharisees are watching this because they're always trying to trip Jesus up, and they're real upset that he's picking grain on the Sabbath, which is considered holy. You're not supposed to work. They say, look, the disciples are working. They need to stop this. And Jesus responds with an interesting saying. He says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And essentially what he's saying here is this. The laws that you were given in the Old Testament were meant to be for your benefit. They're not meant to make life more difficult. And all you guys are doing is making, picking a head of grain into work. And you're making life more difficult as if you can't even eat food on the Sabbath. And the reason I bring this story up whenever I discuss this issue is, a lot of people say, look, at why is the Bible against homosexuality? There's no good reason. And they think, hey, it's just blind faith that Christians decide that, hey, homosexuality is bad. The Bible says so. Therefore, I believe it. End of story. But in reality, if we look into the, into the facts of homosexuality, we can see that there are very good reasons why the Bible says homosexuality is wrong. In Leviticus 18.22, it says, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman that is detestable. In Leviticus 20.13, it says essentially the same thing. Now, often I hear people say, hey, the Old Testament law no longer applies, or if you're going to apply that, why not apply everything about... Not? Right, and yeah. yet the New Testament talks about homosexuality as well. It, exactly, and you see in 1 Corinthians 6 and Romans chapter 1, it still deals with the, the issue of homosexuality. Now, I, I want to be uh, sensitive about this issue because I know that most people out there know somebody who's... Uh, in, engaged in the homosexual lifestyle. That's a part of their life. That's the way they live. And uh, we always want to be loving. The, the, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, hey, if you don't have love, you are useless. You might as well be a clanging gong. You might as well be banging sound in somebody's ear. And it basically says your, your, your words are worthless if you don't have love. So I really want to emphasize that I'm not saying this because I want to condemn homosexuals. Um, the Christ, uh, Christ said, I have not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And so I want to come at this from the perspective of, hey, I want to let you know if you don't know what can happen to somebody who's engaging, specifically men engaging in the homosexual lifestyle. It can be very dangerous, and there's a lot of people who just aren't aware of the facts regarding that issue. Now, AIDS would be an obvious one that, that people would think of. Absolutely. Now, now, what many people don't know is that uh, 60% of all of the HIV-AIDS cases are among men who have sex with men. Now, this is huge, it's a, it's a gigantic deal, but people don't know this. All 60% of all the new HIV AIDS cases that come out are among men who have sex with men. Now, uh, you only make up, the homosexual community only makes up one to 3% of the entire population, but yet they dominate that field. So you have one to 3% of the population making up 60% of these cases. And it's not just HIV AIDS, it's also things like syphilis. Now, syphilis uh, was practically eradicated in the U.S. up until the 1970s. What's interesting is the 1970s is when uh, homosexual sex began to become legalized in most of the states in our nation. And so what you see here is a direct correlation between homosexual sex and the rise of syphilis. The Washington Times, not too long ago in 2007, they wrote an article stating there has been a, a dramatic increase in syphilis in our country, and it's mostly among the homosexual male population. Now, you know, Jerry Brown recently, uh, you know, passed a law in 2011 stating that all schools, public schools, kindergarten through 12th grade, must teach that homosexuality in, in their social studies classes must teach that homosexuality is okay. Um, they can't talk about any of the negatives of the lifestyle. Now, I think that is, that is uh, not right. I mean, how, how is this possible that there is this direct correlation between HIV, AIDS, and syphilis, and yet uh, we're not going to talk about it with the kids, at least give them the option? I mean, we talk about, hey, have safe sex and all these different things, um, and at least you're warning them about the STDs they can get if they're promiscuous or whatever, and yet when it comes to the issue of homosexuality, for politically correct reasons, Nobody's allowed to talk about the facts, the health consequences of this disease. I used to be a, I used to be a property manager in Hillcrest 
I was an on-site property manager, my wife and I, and uh, probably about uh, of the units we managed, we managed 18 units there in a little complex, and probably about half the people uh, were uh, homosexual, lesbian, or uh, or a male homosexual, and they would turn their rents in, and I would get to talk to them a lot, and and I was friends with a lot of them, and and just very friendly, and I always I got into the habit of saying, hey, how's your life going? Is there anything I can pray for you? And one time, one of the guys was turning in the rent, a young guy, probably in his early 20s, maybe 24, 25, 26, turning in his rent, and he says to me, uh, yeah, actually, there is something you can pray for me for. And I said, what's going on? And, and he said, I just had a friend yesterday die of AIDS. And I, I was like, oh, that's horrible. I'm really sorry, man. And, and I was talking to him for a little bit, and I was just curious. I said to him, how many of your friends have died of AIDS? And he said, I have 12 personal friends that have died of AIDS. Wow. Yeah, and that wow. just blew me away. Um, I had always I had always heard these facts, but to actually be sitting there talking to a guy who was able to say this um, right there was just stunning. And uh, I can't imagine that, going through life dealing with that kind of thing. And I think that somebody, before they get involved in this lifestyle, should be able to know that. And yet our, our government and uh, the culture is pushing that information away um, for, for particular reasons, uh, uh, the freedom to engage in that behavior, which, uh, you know, I just don't think is very, uh, is very fair to the young people growing up in our society. Well, you said it. And, and like, and I, I do think this is becoming a free speech issue. You're just not allowed today to say that homosexuality is wrong, say that it causes harm, anything like that. For all the talk about tolerance, there's a great intolerance toward hearing the other side. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt about it. But, you know, if you drive around up in the Hillcrest area, I went to out on a date with my wife. We went out with some friends, and uh, there's a billboard. There was a billboard up there when, when, I, when I was up there, and it said in big, bold letters, disclose your HIV status. And, uh, you know, it's funny. You don't drive around San Diego seeing billboards that say disclose your HIV status. But in that particular neighborhood, um, that, that billboard was up. And the question is, uh, why? Why is that so significant? And that is because of the high prevalence of HIV in the male homosexual community. Another thing that a lot of people aren't aware of is that the FDA does not allow homosexuals, male homosexuals specifically, um, it, and they don't classify it as homosexuals. They'll say MSM, and for specific reasons. I apologize if this is a little graphic, but it's men who have sex with men. Um, the FDA won't allow them to donate blood. And this is, if you go to the Red Cross website, you can look this up yourself. It actually explains why they don't allow um, people who have slept with the same sex, specifically men. Do you think the day may come where they will allow them to donate blood because it'll be so politically correct that they'll actually <laughs> endanger well, your lives before I, passing any kind of negative law against homosexuality? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I've been wrong before, but... I don't think so. And the reason I don't is because literally you're contaminating the blood supply that's going to people who need blood. And there's a form you fill out when you donate blood and it, it asks you a lot of questions, including questions like, do you do drugs and have you used uh, needles lately or anything? And one of the questions on there is, have you slept with somebody of the same sex? And if you have, they say, I'm sorry, but you can't donate blood. And the reason is, is because HIV is not detectable for the first few months after you, you get it. Yeah. And so they've decided, hey, look, we don't want to take the risk of somebody contaminating the blood supply when we're not able to detect it. Well, I don't know. If they won't allow you to ask if you're in the country legally, they just may not allow that to, that question to be even on the questionnaire in five or ten years. We'll see. Yeah, yeah, we'll I see. I hope I'm wrong, <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and so I, I just want people to be aware. I, I'm not trying to shut down somebody's lifestyle. I'm not trying to condemn somebody. To be, to be honest, I... I care about many of the people. I've I've gone out of my way to be loving towards uh, people who disagree with me on this issue, but I don't think it's right of me or anybody else to leave somebody in the dark who's considering, hey, maybe I want to engage in the homosexual lifestyle. Maybe that's who I am, and them not excuse me, and them not knowing uh, about the consequences, the health consequences, and them not knowing necessarily. I know that the conventional wisdom is that people are born that way, but the truth is, there are many people who once led a homosexual lifestyle who are now married to heterosexuals. Some of them have completely overcome their homosexual impulses. Others haven't, but they've still turned from the lifestyle. And I think 
people just don't even know that that road and that option is open for them as well. As a pastor over the years, particularly a campus pastor, there were many gays and lesbians that came my way in the counseling room. And my heart went out to these people because a lot of them really didn't ask for the situation they were in. Even even if they're not born that way, I think a lot of times uh, our mind can block out things that happened early on in childhood, and they may not be aware of some of the incidents that caused them to become that way. So I think they're telling the truth yeah. when they say, I've always had these impulses. But the jury is really out oh. on what causes this. And, 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 and yet people are acting like we know for a fact that it's genetic. And th- those studies are completely inconclusive. It has never been proven. Oh, in, in fact, it's gone the other direction. Um, there's no doubt about it that it's gone the other direction. Uh, Francis Collins, who is the head of the Human Genome Project, considered the worldwide expert on genetics, has said homosexuality is not hardwired. Now, there are genetic components, there's no doubt about it, but um, to be able to say it, it, it's genetics like eye color or hair color or skin color or something like that is just silly. And Dean Hammer of the American Cancer Institute, who did one of the early studies, he said we do not negate psychosocial factors. So even he admitted that there were other factors that could lead into it. Yeah, and Dean Hamer, by the way, is homosexual himself. And, and, and that was pretty honest of him. Exactly. So, you know, so that's really important. Um, you know, I want to talk just a little bit more about uh, the, the health consequences of the homosexual lifestyle simply because um, I just don't hear about it. I hear shows where people talk about the issue of homosexuality and the issue of marriage and all these things pretty frequently. But I feel like there's a big gaping hole. Nobody wants to talk about the health consequences. And um, I don't want to shy away from that because it's politically incorrect or whatever, because I really feel that this is an important part of the discussion over this issue. Um, the, the reality is here is uh, I quoted the Washington Times on syphilis. That was a 2007 article that syphilis rates have, have risen. Um, and homosexuals make up, according to... Um, most studies, 64% of all syphilis cases are among men who are ha- having sex with men. This is uh, from a 1% to 2% of the population, again. Um, a lot of people have heard this statistic that homosexuals make up 10% of the population. This is derived from an old study that was done by Kinsey, uh, who actually only used prison inmates in his study. Wasn't he the one that was trying to say one out of four? Or, yeah, or yeah, kids? it's just yeah. crazy. It's crazy stuff. So if you actually look into the facts behind this and actually do, do some research on the credibility of the studies, you find it ends up being 1% to 2% of the population. Um, in, in the International Journal of Epidemiology, uh, this was it says here, multiple studies have confirmed homosexual conduct is more hazardous to one's health than a lifetime of chain smoking. Smoking takes 2 to 10 years off an individual's life expectancy. Homosexual conduct takes 8 to 20 years, more than twice that of smoking. And... And, you know, I'm not asking for them to make laws against homosexuality. That's not what I'm doing. I'm, but I'm saying, look, it, if, we, if we make it clear, we require, you know, there's a Surgeon General's warning on, on um, you know, pack, packs of uh, cigarettes. Shouldn't we at least give, uh, you know, some sort of informational campaign, at least allowing people to know these facts? Well, what I hear you saying, Kevin, it is, is that it is an act of compassion to warn people that their lives might be in danger, and yet you would get accused of hate for giving that warning. Exactly. That's very, very sad. I'm here with my guest, Kevin Conover. You're listening to The Bob Siegel Show. We will be right back. Say hello again, not to Kenneth, but Kevin. Kevin Conover. Thanks a lot, Bob. I'm I'm really uh, happy to be able to be here and discuss this issue. And and, uh, you know, I don't want anybody to go out there saying, hey, homosexuality is wrong because the Bible says so, and that's it. That's all I've got. Um, I don't think that's a very uh, intellectual position. Well, if somebody doesn't believe in the Bible, what's the point of quoting it to them anyway? Exactly, exactly. So, you know, I'm continuing to, I want to continue to discuss the uh, consequences of the homosexual lifestyle. Now, some people say, why is the HIV rate so high? Isn't it just as high among uh, heterosexuals? And absolutely not, not even close. Now, anytime you have an environment where there's promiscuity, you're going to have an increase in sexually transmitted infections and diseases. Today on college campuses, among heterosexuals, there is a huge outbreak. Uh, This was reported by the CDC of what's called HPV. It's human papillomavirus. In fact, the CDC said one in four students on college campuses now has HPV. HPV is a horrible, horrible disease. In fact, it's the leading cause of cervical cancer in women. 
And uh, the problem with it is, is that it, it uh, is transmitted not necessarily through sex, but simply through contact. And so it's a very dangerous disease and it's spreading. Now, um, my, my beef here is not just against uh, what, what happens in the homosexual lifestyle as it spreads diseases. It's just against sin in general. The Bible is very clear. Um, in the Old Testament, promiscuity causes sin, uh, causes problems. Adultery causes problems. Divorce causes problems. These are all problems that we have to deal with, we have to address and be honest about. And if we're going to solve these problems in our society, we need to take a hard look at them, face the facts, deal with it, and then make good decisions. And so um, I just want people to have good lives. I, I, I mean that with all my heart. I don't want people to suffer and go through making decisions that they think are no big deal when in fact they have huge consequences down the road. Yeah, Kevin, now I had read once that uh, hepatitis was another result, but I didn't have a chance to authenticate that. Have you read much about hepatitis and its relationship to homosexuality? No doubt about it. Uh, the, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association itself has reported that hepatitis A, B, and C are at increased rates among homosexuals, along with numerous other um, STDs. Do you want to say anything about, uh, obviously, the physical harm, but I believe there's a psychological harm, too, in that if, if something, uh, if some kind of abuse happened to somebody when they were children and homosexuality was the result of that, then rather than viewing these people as sinners, I'm viewing them as victims. Christ not only came to deliver us from sin we commit, he came to deliver us from sin committed against us. Yes, and so I yes. do think there's a psychological harm that people aren't willing to talk about as well. Yes, there's no doubt about it. And I, I really want to emphasize this. If you're out there today and you have you yourself um, have homosexual, uh, are in the homosexual lifestyle, or you, you feel you have homosexual tendencies, or you feel like you're drifting in that direction, um, Christ loves you. He died on the cross for your sins. He died on the cross for my sins. I'm a sinner saved by grace, just the same as anybody else. And you know what Christ did for me? He gave me peace. He gave me an incredible peace in my life that, that is just indescribable. It's amazing to be able to go through life through very difficult times and have an amazing peace from the Lord. And if you're out there today and you're struggling and you don't have peace and you want peace, you know what? Why don't you go visit a church, a good church that you can get a recommendation for where people are going to love you love you to Christ. I'd like to recommend personally the church I attend, Skyline Church out in Rancho San Diego. Our pastor is so loving, so godly, and only wants to reach out and help people out of their difficult situations. Yeah, I go to the same church, and I know this is going to sound like a shameless plug, but gay people come to our church, even gay people who have not turned from the lifestyle, and they come because they know that they're treated with respect and they're loved. Our pastor would say he disagrees with the lifestyle, he would challenge it, but the people are welcome. I know it sounds cliche to say we hate the sin but love the sinner. I know that's a cliche, but but it's also the truth. Absolutely, absolutely. You know what? If you're if you're waiting to go to church before to to get cleaned up, please don't don't wait. The church is a place uh, that's meant to be a place of safety. It's meant to be a place of restoration and healing, and that's a process. And and a lot of times it's a lifelong process. Um, you know, we will never be perfect. Nobody nobody among us will ever be perfect until uh, we get to heaven. And God gives us, uh, but but he can make us whole in the sense that he died on the cross for our sins, paid the price for our sins, and says, guess what, Kevin? I am going to, in your place, I am going to give you my righteousness. I was perfect, and you weren't, and you don't deserve this, but out of my grace, my mercy, and because I just want to have a relationship with you, I'm going to give you my perfection. And uh, that's an amazing gift. And God doesn't expect you to feel guilty if you have homosexual inclinations, it's the actions we're responsible for. The Bible tells us that all of us are guilty of sinful actions, and we all have sinful inclinations. In fact, you could say we are all born with a sin nature. If you want to talk about how we're born, all of us are born with a propensity towards sin. So it's the actions that God holds you responsible for. I interviewed somebody who was involved with Exodus Ministries, which we should highly recommend. There are yeah, many people Exodus. that go to this ministry and they get... And this man said something very interesting to me, because in his case, he he did not feel that he had become a heterosexual. and uh, I But I wanted to embrace that. I didn't want to... A lot of times Christians rush over like puppy dogs and they lay hands on people and they think they're going to immediately heal them of everything. And he said something I've never forgotten. He said, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. The opposite of homosexuality is holiness. 
I thought that was a very interesting way to say it. So nobody's asking you to wave a magic wand and, and make your tendencies go away. Yes, God holds you responsible for your actions. Having said that, there are people that have received therapy toward the, yeah. the tendencies too. Yeah. Now that, that can happen also. Absolutely. I, I had a guy when I was managing those apartments in Hillcrest, a guy, another guy I had a chance to talk to, he said to me, um, I, we were talking and he said, yeah, could you pray for me? He said, I'm, I have a wedding coming up. And now he had already told me he was homosexual. And at that point in time, uh, you know, marriage was not legal in California for homosexuals. And I, I said to him, really, uh, what's going on there? You know, because I, I didn't understand how this would work out. And he said, well, I'm engaged to a woman. And I said, does she know that you're homosexual? He said, no. And I said, you're kidding me. You're going to marry her without her knowing that. And he said, I don't know what else to do. I don't know how to get out of this, but I don't want to be homosexual anymore. And I said, why not? He said, well, and, and this is coming from his mouth. This is, you know, this is not me making this up or anything. He said, I don't want to die alone. And he said, I know that if I continue in this lifestyle, I'll die alone. And, uh, you know, I prayed for him and I gave him some resources to get help and counseling. And uh, I pray to God that wherever he is today, that he's blessed and he's doing doing well and, and uh, he's able to achieve that, that joy in the Lord. I, I, I talk to him about Christ and all. Our heart goes out to you if you're homosexual. We don't hate you. We don't condemn you. Our heart goes out to you. We'll be right back. Yes, we all want to find somebody to love, whether we are gay or straight. I'm here with my good friend, Kevin Conover, who is a superb apologist and uh, always honored to have him on the show. Kevin, we were talking about the fact that God doesn't expect people to wave a magic wand and automatically get over their tendencies. It's the actions. And yet there was a man named Charles Securities who for 20 years had, had all kinds of documentation of successfully giving healing to homosexuals. And he was around in 1973 when the American Psychiatric Association declassified homosexuality as an emotional disorder. And this is what people go back and point to now as this sacred cow saying, well, it's been proven now that people are born this way. But people don't understand that was not based on scholarly research, but it was based on a lot of political pressure from militant gay activist psychiatrists. So pressured did people feel that there was a vote taken about whether to declassify by, by secret ballot. Only one third of the votes were ever turned in. Out of that one third, 53 percent, a very small majority, agreed to declassify homosexuality as an emotional disorder. But that was 53 percent of the one third. Two thirds weren't even sent back in. Four years later, Time Magazine did a survey, and some 80% of psychiatrists said they still thought it was a, a disorder. Charles Securities went on record, and I'm quoting him, he said, this was the greatest medical hoax ever perpetrated against our nation. Yeah, you know what else is very interesting about that decision is that one of the key doctors involved in that uh, process of getting uh, homosexuality out of the diagnostic, Diagnostics and Statistical Manual is Dr. Robert Spitzer. Uh, if you're listening on the radio, I encourage you write down his name. He was um, he he is one of the key people to get homosexuality out of the DSM-4 as a mental disorder. But what's interesting is he did an, a study in 2001 and completely reversed his own opinion about that issue, and that decided that no, I was wrong. Uh, homosexuals can change to heterosexuality. And what we're learning more and more is this: is that sexuality is somewhat uh, bendable. Um, meaning it's on a continuum. Um, and so you have extreme masculinity and then you have extreme femininity. And there are things in our lives, including genetics, including the way we're raised, including things that happen to us as we grow up that impact us uh, sexually. And our sexuality is is uh, determined to a certain degree by these things. Now, not everybody re reacts the same way to these things, but that's the reality. Now, we, we know this also too, They've done twin studies, and what they're finding now is this, is that uh, in Aust they did an Australian twin study. They had 14,000 identical twins that were studied, and what they found was that when you had one twin that was homosexual and um, another one that wasn't, this was how it was in a 30%, I believe it was 38% of the cases. Now, Yeah, they made a big deal out of the fact that in two-thirds the twins came out both gay, but they, but they don't explain the one third where they didn't come out. That no, way. no, no, no. It's one third. It's one third that came out the same. 
it's two thirds. Okay, that then I must be different. thinking of a different study because there was another study where they claimed that they claimed that only one third came out differently, yeah, and that they still couldn't explain that. That's third. called a snowball study, uh-huh. and this this is a different kind of study. If you actually take a a, a well done study, there have been two that are that are the most successful, and the one on Australia it has the biggest population that they use, and um, it's anywhere from the, the Australian one ended up with I believe about thirty percent. The snowball studies, even those end up at a maximum of 50%. And so in that case, what we're seeing here is, okay, this is not purely genetic. It's not possible. Okay, otherwise you would have an identical twins. They would both be homosexual. And I've heard that in studies with lesbians, this was almost zero when they studied the twins. Uh, that these I, were just in male studies. That they yeah, did. I've heard it's lower than than heterosexual, I'm, I'm sorry, homosexual men, but it's, uh, I haven't heard that it was zero. But, uh, I, you know, there's another point I want to point out here that a lot of people seem to... They don't understand. When you put two men together, there is a different dynamic than when you put a man and a woman together. Um, There was a study done by Lambda. Now, Lambda is a gay publication, and they did this study interviewing uh, homosexuals, and what they found was this 24% of gay men had more than 100 partners, 43% of gay men had more than 500 partners, and 28% of gay men had more than 1,000 partners. Now, this is this is Lambda doing this. This is not some Christian publication trying to, uh, you know, get rid of uh, homosexuality. This is a gay publication doing this study. Now, what's interesting about this is this. that when you put two men together, men tend to be more promiscuous than do women. Women tend to be want to more fidelity in their relationships. And this is why men typically drive, for example, the pornography uh, uh, business, okay? You have 80% of men driving the pornography business as opposed to 20%. This is an addiction, okay? Now, men are visually stimulated. Now, think about this. Here's a man. He's got more testosterone typically than a woman. He's more aggressive typically than a woman. He's visually stimulated. He tends to be a risk taker. He has lots of free time and lots of money because generally speaking, they don't have kids. He rejects biblical morality, right? Says there's no God, okay? He has he doesn't have a woman in the relationship to restrain him from doing things that are more risky than normal. Well, put two guys together and what do you have? You have the perfect storm. Of course, you're going to have more promiscuity. Of course, you're going to have more relationships. And haven't there been far less monogamous marriages amongst male homosexuals than female? That's exactly right. In Holland, male homosexual relationships last on average one and a half years. Gay men have an average of eight partners a year outside of their committed relationships. So for all the fighting for the rights to get married, very few of them are staying married anyway. That's exactly right. Now, it's very different from lesbians. And I've heard that with... With lesbians, not only do they stay more into the committed relationship, but a lot of times the sexual part of it goes away and they just remain emotional companions. Well, there's some really interesting things that develop out of um, uh, what to putting two women together. It, what's very interesting, again, is promiscuity among lesbian women is less extreme than men, but it's still higher than among heterosexual women. Many lesbian women actually have sex with men, too, and... They're, they're four times as likely to have more than 50 lifetime male partners than heterosexual women. Well, every single lesbian I ever counseled as a pastor, and there were many, they mm-hmm. all told me that they were attracted to men. There you go. There you go. And Whereas with males, I wasn't hearing that. With males, I was hearing, I can't remember a time yep. when I wasn't attracted to men. But with me- women, it was very different. Yeah, and this all has to do with the way we're designed. Men are creating a sexual addiction, okay? And this is why they're not attracted to women, because it's, an, it's addiction-oriented. Lesbians, on the other hand, is not an addiction. What it is is it's a uh, it's a desire to be connected, to build depth in the relationship. And so they're not necessarily addicted to women or addicted to men. They're looking for a relationship. They're looking for somebody love me just as I am. Love me without trying to get something from me. And so this is why that happens. Now, I know there's pl- – if there are any people out there listening that are on the left or – or uh, you know, haven't heard this stuff before, I challenge you to do the research on this. I challenge you to look at the other side. I'm not just um, spouting off random nonsense here. This is reality. And do it soon because I honestly believe, and I, you know, I don't mean to sound like Paul Revere here, but I, I believe the day's gonna come where the research on the other side is not even gonna be available. In, in many countries in Europe now, it is against the law to say anything negative about homosexuality. There's already a law like that in California as well for the public schools. There's an attempt to make that the law of the land. So do your research while you can, folks, because this is also a free 
speech issue. This is Bob Siegel and Kevin Conover. We'll be right back. Welcome back to our program. This is Bob Siegel and Kevin Conover. We're discussing the mildly, just mildly controversial subject of homosexuality. It doesn't invoke a lot of emotion with people, but you know, <laughs> something to do, something a little different to talk about today. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, it 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 uh, bothers me that it's so um, it's such a, a touchy issue. I want to give one more example. I try to do this because I want people to know that I love people. I. I'm not discussing this because I, I'm against or want to condemn homosexuals. My wife and I were in a pregnancy class, and there were probably about eight couples in. The last couple to come in was uh, two lesbians in the birthing class. It was a birthing uh, kind of Lamaze kind of class. And uh, it was done, it was a private uh, studio kind of thing. Well, we, we were kind of thrown off a little bit because we had never encountered anything like that. But we were like, hey, you know what? Um, we just need to love people and uh, just be kind and generous. We came back next week. Every other couple had left the group except us. And it ended up being me and my wife and these two lesbians. And um, we went out of our way to tell them that we loved them. And we brought them tons of baby clothes because we had already had one kid. And uh, we brought them uh, food. We ended up having breakfast with them. Uh, we, we ended up uh, just trying to say, hey, look, we want you to know that we love you, we're not opposed to you. They knew I was a Bible teacher. They knew I believed in the Bible. They knew our position on things. But we went out of our way to love people. So again, I just want to emphasize that. I'm not saying these things because I hate gays or something. Yeah, and people are afraid they're going to condemn us. I was at the bedside of a young man that had AIDS. He was in his early 20s. And he was afraid of what I might say. And he asked me if God was punishing him for being homosexual. Now, like you said, there there are, are dangers that could have been a byproduct of it. I, I said, no, my friend, God is not punishing you. The punishment that we deserve, you and I and all of us for our sins, was put upon Jesus. That's what happened to your punishment. What God wants to do is heal you and forgive you. He's not here to punish you. Yeah, exactly. Um, I But now I want to I get on to a little bit of the constitutional issues here, and, and here's what I'm talking about. There's a lot of confusion that this is a discrimination issue that, hey, Christians or whoever is opposed to uh, homosexual marriage is discriminating. This is not a discrimination issue. It's a definition issue. This is really important to understand in this discussion. And this is not about um, capturing the proper words. Let me explain what I mean by this. If I say to two guys, one's heterosexual and one's homosexual, if I say neither of you can drink and drive, I haven't discriminated, okay? If I say to both a heterosexual and a homosexual, neither of you can drive without a license, I have not discriminated. If I say neither of you can sleep with a minor, I have not discriminated. If I say neither of you can marry a close relative, I have not discriminated. If I say neither of you can marry the same sex, I have not discriminated. Okay, and so I want to be very clear, this is not a discrimination issue. The law is being applied equally to both homosexuals and heterosexuals. It has to do with how marriage is defined. Currently, marriage is defined as a man and a woman. Okay, now that being the case, the question is, do we want to change the definition of marriage? If we do, that'll open up Pandora's box. Exactly. So how do we tell a polygamist that they can't marry three or four people after that? It'll be impossible. That's exactly to right. To do that with any consistency. Absolutely. I was outside of Target talking to a lesbian who was trying to get me to sign a petition to move homosexual marriage forward, and I, and I asked her this very question. So what does this mean for polygamy? And she said, I think polygamy should be legal. Okay, and the reality here is this. If we broaden the definition um, so wide, pretty soon marriage becomes anything anybody wants to make it. There are people that believe sex between uh, adults and children act, should act, be legal. Yep. There are professors teaching that. And in the Diagnostic Statistical Disorder DSM-4, we talked about DSM-3, they actually declassified pedophilia as an emotional disorder. Yeah, so and do don't call in and say we're comparing gays to pedophiles. We're not. We're just saying if you're going to look to the psychiatric community – when they declassify something, look at everything they've done, not just one issue. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time left here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna make this case real quickly. But essentially, um, the reason marriage needs to stay defined as a man and a woman is two particular reasons. First of all, um, marriage as it is helps to bond men and women who have sex and make babies with the child. Okay, it brings the child together. Um, social consequences of Breaking a child apart from his biological parent are huge. It's gigantic. The, the, there's overwhelming evidence that that's the case. 
And so if you change the definition, you are breaking apart um, in, in numerous situations, you're breaking apart the relationship between the biological parent and the child. This is a critical, critical issue. Um, another reason is because essentially if you, if you change the definition of marriage, it can be expanded into anything. There was a guy in, in one of the states a while back, and people are going to think I'm joking about this, but he tried to marry his horse. But Well, if you look at the direction of animal rights activists, I, that's it, not so far-fetched anymore. Exactly. And so the government has an interest in making sure a man and a woman who plan on having kids stay together. This is why we want the government to be involved. Some people say just get the government out of it. But the reality is, just like many other things, it's important that the government encourages that relationship so that kids are raised up and the next generation uh, is able to reap the benefits of a good marriage held together. Well, you know, Kevin, I'm always hearing from, from the left people saying, oh, it's good that we have men and women on the Supreme Court because a woman will bring a different perspective than a man. But you get these same people talking about marriage. Oh, well, then will a husband and a wife bring a different perspective? They totally switch gears. Yeah, that's absolutely the case, you know. And so um, that's critical that that uh, men and women are. Now, we want the government out of relationships that aren't marriage. So if I have a relationship with a best friend, I don't need to go get a best friend license. Okay, if I have a relationship with my sister, right, I don't need to go get a sister license or a roommate license or anything else. We want the government as, as uninvolved as possible. But when it comes to the issue of two people making life and then raising a child, we have an interest in the government encouraging that relationship. But if two men want to get together, there's no reason for the government to be involved in that particular decision. Uh, I've heard people say, well, what about rights to visit in the hospital or what about well, rights most to- Most states have civil unions now, not all, but most of them have them, but they're allowed to do that now anyway. You don't even need civil unions. You can go to a lawyer and draw up a contract. Anybody can visit somebody in the hospital if they if they want to, there's no problem with. And that. when you add to that liberal churches and gay churches that have been having homosexual weddings for years, the truth is they've already had this right. What's happening is they're trying to get the rest of us to change the definition of marriage. They're looking for affirmation. Yes, they want legal affirmation, forced affirmation, and that's the real agenda here. That's absolutely right. And again, the point I'm making is this: if you broaden the definition of marriage, where are you to stop that definition? Somebody might say, well. We stop it at two consenting adults. But who are you to say we should stop it at two consenting adults? And a polygamist comes along and says, no, it should be a man and two women. Well, if you can't stop it at a gender, then why do you have to even stop it at an adult at all or any numerical amount of adults? That's right. There's yeah. nowhere to draw a line in the sand. No, it's totally going to open the thing just open wide for everybody. Absolutely. We have plenty of people in this country who would love to be married to more than one person. Again, uh, and people might say, well, what's wrong with polygamy? Uh, I met a kid who used to live in Utah who had a father who was a polygamist. It was a Mormon, and uh, he said he hates his dad. He said his dad had 11 wives and 30 kids. He said, I never got to talk to my father. Okay, there are ramifications to changing what marriage is. People make a say, hey, no big deal. Let people do what they want. Yeah, but, you know, we used to have no-fault divorce. Uh, I'm sorry, we used to have, uh, you had to have a reason for your divorce. Now in California, we have no-fault divorce. Well, we faced the consequences of that. We have tons of kids who don't have their parents, who are being shifted back and forth between their parents. And we need to consider that there are consequences to changing the social structure that's been set up. And then some people say, well, there should be separation between church and state. But we have already had churches getting sued for not allowing civil unions on their property. So that separation never seems to cut both ways with people. Yeah, and I've heard people say, hey, you can't legislate morality. What do, you, what do you think thou shalt not murder is? That's legislating morality. All legislation is based on somebody's view of morality. I, exactly. What we have to look at is not argue about whether it's a morality or a church and state issue. We have to look at the consequences. And if we evaluate the consequences of changing this and we dig deep and we look into the health consequences, we look into the social consequences of kids and their parents, uh, the consequences are huge, both from a health perspective, a social perspective, a social problem perspective. And when people get together to vote on this, they vote for marriage being between a man and a woman, and it's usually the courts going and overturning it. That's right. We have more than 33 states that have defensive marriage acts on, their, on the books in their state. 
We have six states that approve of homosexual marriage. And I believe that most of the ones that approve of it, it was because of the courts, not because of the people. There might have been one or two that came through the people, but yeah, I believe I, most of them came through the courts. That's absolutely right. I, I, I believe there's three now that just since the last election. Uh, but a lot of this has to do with people being uninformed about this debate and understanding uh, yeah. both sides of the issue. Well, Kevin, let's talk about this again sometime on her show. <laughs> a couple of weeks from now, we're going to find out how the Supreme Court ruled. So it's this is not going away anytime soon, any more than abortion went away after Roe v. Wade. Yeah, and my website is educateforlife.org. If I'm going to be posting a lot of stuff on this issue. If you found it interesting, you want to do your research, you'll have a lot of resources on my website, educateforlife.org. Well, Kevin, have a happy Easter, and we'll see you. You'll be back with us in April sometime. Absolutely. All right, we'll see you then. Have a happy Easter, everybody.